Hey, Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. On the show, I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Before we get on with the show, quick sponsor message. Today's episode sponsored by Barrels Ahead. Barrels Ahead, we help the wine and craft industry scale their business through authentic content. Go to barrelsahead.com today to learn more. Today, I'm super excited to talk with Mike Matheny. Mike's the winemaker and co-founder of Three, Three of Cups Winery in the Artisan Hill area, Woodenville, Washington. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, Drew. Happy to be here. Oh, thank you so much for being on. So in the in the pre-show, we were we were talking about how we have a, a common friend. We had um Mike Janowick on the show a few months ago. Andrew. Yeah. Andrew. Andrew. Uh, you're yeah. you're my that, <laughs> That's his dad. It's okay. It's all good. I know them all. Yeah. There's just so few mics out there. Yeah. Yeah. How do you guys know each other? Uh Andrew and I uh share uh, a block up on Royal Slope in a vineyard called Stillwater Creek, which is managed by Ed Kelly, which is a former Napa uh, vineyard manager that made his way up to Washington and has been managing Stillwater Creek for quite a few years now. And uh, we both get Salt Blanc out of there. Um, so they get a lot of fruit out of there. And they're, I think their winery's owner owns the entire, or the owner's, the family owns the vineyard up there that they get all their fruit from. Oh, cool. Cool. So... During they, harvest, we're constantly texting each other. Hey, what numbers are you getting? What, how's the fruit taste? You're right, because we both can't be in two places at the same time. But uh, the pairing up together, it helps a lot. Yeah, that's the part. The part about Washington being it's it's such a small collaborative type of community up there. It is. It, it really is. And you know, with the a big number of us producing our wines over here on the west side mm -hmm. uh, versus the east side. If people aren't familiar, we got that Cascade Range kind of separate in the desert versus the the rainforest, so you might say. So it's 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 a lot of driving, and we spend a lot of time going back and forth between vineyards and here on the west side. Yeah, that, it's vital to like kind of share the knowledge because you don't want to just hop over the range every every time you want to check the sugar levels. <laughs> yeah, no. So we're we're very fortunate to be able to work with other wineries and ask them what's going on when they and what do they see what's going on in the same vineyards that we work with. Oh, for sure. So I got a. Kind of start from the start. How did you get your start in the wine industry? You weren't, it looks like you had a background in tech. I do, but it, it all kind of started when my wife became gluten-free. I was in the Boeing Beer and Wine Club. I, Boeing hired me down in Southern California and they moved me up to Washington State. And I joined that and I was brewing, doing home brewing and mm -hmm. she, my wife became gluten-free. And I had for a few years struck her up and down the West Coast of beer festivals and and then when she found out she had gluten issues and she always drank wine, we, I drink beer with dinner. She would have a wine and I decided I wanted to make some wine for her. Uh -huh. And back in 2004, we did a trip to Napa and I kind of got a little fascinated with the whole process and that what it takes two years to make a wine versus two <laughs> weeks to make a beer. Right. So that that kind of intrigued me. And I'm an electromechanical engineer by training. So it's kind of wow. the, the the whole process of it kind of fascinated me a little bit. And then up here in Washington, that same year, there was a wine festival out what was called the Herb Farm in Fall City. And there's an Herb Farm restaurant now here in Woodenville that's really well known. But it used to actually just be a herb farm. And they had the first Washington wine festival out there. And all 11 or 12 Woodville winemakers, you know, there's over a hundred wineries here in Woodville now, but back then they were all there and I got to talk with them and just got hooked on the passion that they had for it and what they were doing and the process as they explained it to me. And everybody was really friendly and helpful. And next thing I know, I'm uh, volunteering uh, for a local winery, helping them with their first harvest. And I just got, I got hooked after that and uh, stuck with the volunteering for a, a couple of years and then decided to go back to school in 2009 and get my enology and viticulture degrees. And then kept working in tech as a mm -hmm. consultant for a few years because I was already accustomed to a certain income level. Uh -huh. It was hard to... It was hard to, be, you know, get paid 45000 a year as an assistant winemaker at a boutique winery, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And then uh, Lisa, my partner, and she's the majority owner. We're a woman-owned winery. Lisa mm -hmm. hired me for a job at Microsoft. And uh, I was giving her wine. 
I was making it in the garage and she kept saying, Hey, we need to do something. This is better than most of the wine I buy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I kept trying to tell her, no, it's the worst business plan <laughs> I've absolutely come up with. Didn't they teach you that in business school? And, uh, and I, I stepped away from the wine for a, a, about a year because my mom was having some health issues. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, she hired me again for another gig. And that time, and over a night of some brandy, I made out of some Pinot that I had bought from down in the gorge. I didn't like how it came out. So I made brandy out of it and we drank it and got a little, got a little shit face. Uh -huh. And the next thing I know, we're starting a winery together. So, which is probably how the best thing usually happened. That's amazing. That's, that's fantastic. Sorry for the long story, but no, that's, that's, no, that's, it, it was a bit of a journey. <laughs> no, that is fantastic. And now full-time wine. Now I retired from tech in September of 20, right before mm -hmm. harvest. And then my mom had some health issues again in 21 and mm -hmm. ended up passing away, unfortunately. And I've been, I just decided to stick with wine ever since. Sure. I, many people have. How did, when you made the leap from beer to wine, you're a brewer, you were making beer. The, and you're the, I think you're the third person I've talked to in the course of the year that got their roots in the Boeing Beer and Wine Club. Boeing gives you good access. I mean, they bring in a big truck with a bunch of grapes on it. Everybody help yourself. It's got a lot of different stuff on there. It's mm -hmm. really well coordinated, a bunch of volunteers that do the work and things. And there's a lot of shared equipment, but I wanted access to better equipment, wanted access to better grapes. I was really like in Red Mountain and a few other places. And they don't, they don't back then when I was doing that stuff, they didn't necessarily have access to some of those grapes and, or they weren't off the buying the same within 24 yeah. hours, you know? So it, it was a great start for me and gave me some basic skills and stuff. But what I really learned was volunteering at wineries to, yeah. and then transitioning to book knowledge as well. Yeah. I wonder if that did, did they have an alumni list? I don't like know. A, I mean, it almost I mean, seemed like the, an incubator. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny in my building, um, I share our, our production space here in Woodenville. We share it with Kevin White Winery and Avenia Winery. Mm -hmm. um, Avenia is owned by X Microsoft. Kevin White works at Microsoft. Uh -huh. You know, I worked at Microsoft as a full-time employee for nine years and then as mm -hmm. a contractor off and on for about seven years. So I, I'd say Microsoft is probably as big an incubator yeah. as anybody here for wine industry. Mm, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So talking about three of cups, how did you get that name? The podcast. Is there a video that goes with the oh, podcast? Yeah. yeah, there's a, we have it on YouTube too. So, oh, okay. Let me grab that. Definitely a visual on. component. And for the audio listeners, you've got my keen description. Of so what I'm um, I grabbed, uh, I'm tasting our 19 Syrah this morning, Walla Walla Valley, Lake Galeen's Vineyard. Um, I was just entering it in for some reviews mm -hmm. and uh, um, so, oh, here reason I got mm -hmm. it. The logo. So that's the wine stain from the business plan on the cocktail napkin that night. It was a doodle turned into a logo. So mm -hmm. the circles represent all of us sitting around the table that night. And actually okay. there were four. Um, and Lisa is half Chinese uh -huh. and four is an unlucky number. So we smashed the partner, you know, our spouses into one circle and the other circle is us. And then the other represents our friends and family who helped us get this started. And uh, we liked the logo and we just started asking around for friends with names with three in it. And it was a friend that suggested the tarot card. Uh, hang on, tarot card coming up. I volunteer in radio. So I'm sorry for the silence there. <laughs> uh, tarot card, three of cups oh. tarot card, right? So it's actually the wine drinking tarot card, at least our, inter our loose interpretation. It means coming together, friends and family, conviviality. And that is exactly what wine drinking is. And we really liked what it meant. And more importantly, the dot com was available on GoDaddy for twelve dollars and fifty cents. That's fantastic. I love. It, I really, it was I really fantastic. love when it, I really love when a when a logo has a really good story behind it. I hear quite quite a few far fetched explanations, but this one's really <laughs> right on. And then you got the tarot card to match with it. Yeah, was, we didn't uh, save the napkin though, so that's a sad. You know, it's not framed somewhere that had the original logo on it. But we worked with a, a graphic designer that kind of made it more perfect circle than what was originally there. 
No, that's that's cool. No, that's a that's a great logo. So Thanks. talk to me, talk to me about um launching a winery. Yeah, it's tough. I'd worked for quite a few small wineries. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got out at WSU Bid School, I went to work for Constellation. And they put me at Hogue Cellars over in Eastern Washington, which is quite a large cellar winery done in about 400,000 cases at the time when I was there. And so I've done big and I've done small and mm -hmm. big, like very small, like less than a thousand cases. And I spent most of my time here in town working for Chris Gorman of Gorman Winery and a little bit of time at a few other wineries. I, I told Lisa when we started that we didn't really want any other investors. We wanted to do the money with our own, which mm -hmm. probably in hindsight was the wrong thing to do. But we, I also didn't want to have to move stuff to do stuff. And what that means is you're constantly playing Tetris inside of a smaller boutique winery because of you're in the amount of space that you can afford to do the work. Mm -hmm. And I wanted an area big enough, like I wanted our bail room to be separated area entity from our other. Mm -hmm. Lisa kind of had the expectation that we were only going to do maybe like 500, 600 cases. We we're going to sell to friends and family and uh. maybe grow a little bit and go overseas. And then I came in with the idea that, oh, hey, let's let's do 3,000 cases and uh -huh. get going. So we compromised and we started off that first year with just, I think about 550, 600 cases. And then slowly, slowly grew it. We're up to about, we were hitting 3,000 right before COVID. Mm -hmm. That slowed us down a little bit for the last couple of years. And then we just picked up the pace again with the 2022 harvest to back where we were basically looking at it right pre-COVID. About 2,500, 3,000 cases? Yeah, we'll end up this year right around 2,700 cases probably is what we'll we'll end up bottling. Now, all the people, and we have a lot of listeners that are, you know, they, they have dreams of opening up a winery and <laughs> ramping it up is always difficult because there's certain, with the amount of case quantity and the amount of you know, storage and barrels. Yep. There's certain like tiers where you reach over one level, suddenly you're at another scale and profitability yeah. goes down. Talk to me about some of those, like as you scaled from 500 to 2,500. So, yeah. And, you know, I bought my forklift essential tool from Boeing Surplus. Uh -huh. uh, right. So that was, that was, I wasn't still working at Boeing, but I had friends who were in uh -huh. the fleet management group. So I knew when this, I knew when the forklifts were turned back into Pape and, you know, and there was just, and we always wanted our own equipment. So mm -hmm. I bought used equipment. I have a bladder press that I bought from Bar Estates down in Paso Robles that I ended up having to rebuild shortly after purchasing it from them. We bought our crusher to stemmer, our auger from Mark Ryan winery. And we always had the plan that we would buy equipment that could support and help us grow. Like, mm -hmm. It would work for a while, knowing that, right, on the depreciation schedule as well. And we have about a four, we're in about a 3,700 square foot facility. Mm -hmm. uh, and we knew that it could probably handle up to about 4,000 cases, right? Okay. So that gave us plenty of room when we first started in order to be able to expand over the years, still do what we want, have room for all our equipment, and in Washington, be able to crush indoors, especially mm -hmm. important over here on the west side, because uh, it's not always the greatest weather. Sometimes you get some weird stuff going on during harvest and things like that. <laughs> so it, it was it was kind of important to have all that. So coming up with a, a business plan, and we did a five year business plan, and then we expanded that to eight years. And you know we're on our ten year anniversary now, so we're pretty happy. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, how it how it's turned out. But with that said, we've been kind of winging it for the last two years because we just didn't know what the heck was going to happen with COVID. Mm -hmm. So we 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 kind of put a lot of growth and development on hold until we saw what was going to happen. And you know, we are very fortunate. We have a we have a great wine club, and mm -hmm. they kind of carried us through. You know, we have probably less than a three percent drop in our wow. wine club overall year over year. And I, we're recognized for quality fruit, good wines out at very reasonable prices compared to what you'll see from other producers here in the state. So, you know, we work really hard to keep those numbers at that because, I mean, this is a passion for Lisa and I. We're not, our long-term goal isn't to, you know, make a million at this and grow to such a size that we have to have an entire staff. 
we're a two person operation. Oh. And that's also kept in mind as far as our overhead. My son helps out during harvest. Her stepson helps out once in a while. You know, our spouses work events with us. You know, we cover over 50 local wine events each year. And then we have sales independent and also distribution that help us as well. So kind of going into it, I was fortunate in that working for large wineries and working for already well-recognized wineries here in town, I had connections for grapes. I knew what rows I wanted in the Mm -hmm. blocks that I wanted. So I was able to work with those growers, get those blocks that I, because I already had a relationship with a lot of them, get the spots I wanted and also work with some emerging vineyards that I knew about and get grapes at an affordable cost. Mm -hmm. And we were able to keep our overhead really low over the last four or five years, or, you know, in our first initial years while we were growing it, but it's, it's, it's really expensive. It, you know, like they say in the wine business, and I, I've heard of 15 different versions of this, but, you know, show me $5 million and I'll, sh- I'll you'll make a million in the wine business. Yeah. Right. And it, it is absolutely true that it takes a lot of capital to run a winery. We, we, Lisa and I like to joke that we started a business so we could write checks to other people. And that's what it feels like on some days. But, you know, it, when we're meeting with customers and selling wine and at events and talking to, you know, people just about wine in general, it's all worth it. Yeah, I, I, Lisa has a day job still. She still works. And then I have a sugar mama uh, being, <laughs> being, being being semi-retired, yeah, my wife, I saw it my in wife has a day job. Yeah. Semi-retired. So that, that really helps. I mean, if you're to those people looking at that 3,000 case winery, unless you're going to be DIYing it and really, yeah. really running streamlined, it's there's there's not a lot of profit for employees. No, and it's getting harder and harder. You know, everything is going up. Glass, the glass industry seems to be stabilizing a little bit. Thankfully, um, gosh. Yeah. I mean, that's been the story the last year of just... People not even be able to bottle. Yes. We, you know, and just even paper shortages for labels and, you know, just all kinds of things that we've had to, and being small, we're flexible. Mm -hmm. Being large, you're not so flexible. So we've got those kind of advantages, but absolutely, you know, and we also have the, you know, during this last harvest, I don't want to segue into any, if you want to talk about harvest, but like the 22 harvest was a very difficult harvest for a lot of people because we had that that spring freeze and then and a, a late a wet uh, uh, bud break and it was just everything was pushed back uh, over a month in some cases right and if we went and had a really warm October which is kind of unusual for us up here I'd say there probably been a huge crop loss in a lot of areas and absolutely in some of the cooler vineyards a lot of reds did not make it across the line to for finish. We were fortunate enough being small in that we had enough capacity. We didn't have to turn our tanks over in order to meet capacity of a 20,000 or plus winery. Whereas a lot of wine makers that I was talking to during harvest were like, I got to get the fruit in and I'm going to have to pick it early. I'm going to have to ferment it. I'm going to have to get it out of my tank. And then so I can make room for the next, next step coming in. So, I mean, just kind of, planning for that and not buying everything new. And, you know, I think the only thing we have bought new in our winery are a few tanks and a few ferment bins. Everything else has been used. Well, I take it back. We bought a few new pick bins as well, but predominantly used equipment out there on the market. And I'm fortunate in that I have the kind of background where I can tear stuff apart and put it back together pretty well. So that's super helpful. Especially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I even I had to go learn to weld. So I wanted to learn welding anyway. So it was kind of like, hey, I haven't used it because I ended up welding stainless steel is, is a craft and I don't get enough experience doing it. But fixing a barrel rack or something like that, I don't I'm not worried about it. Steel, yeah. I'm all that I'm good with, but yeah. uh, stainless steel, no, I, I let the guys who know what they're doing fix that stuff. Oh, for sure. Let's talk about your. Um, so as you're growing and you're now you're, how many vineyards do you have contracts with? It and <laughs> we work with eleven vineyards. Eleven uh, vineyards right now. Yeah, for a small winery, long- right? We like to say we go where we think the fruit does best. So mm-hmm. we're as far north as Brewster, which is about forty minutes north of Lake Chelan. 
And then we also work in the Lakeshaland AVA. And then we go all the way south into Milton Freewater, Oregon, into okay. the, what they call the Rocks District. But predominantly, our fruit is Red Mountain uh, mm -hmm. AVA and Walla Walla Valley. Oh, yeah. Now, how would you describe your house style? Old world, French. Old world. I prefer the Rhones. Mm -hmm. uh, my own personal tastes are drink a lot of champagne and Pinot, but mm -hmm. I haven't tried. I don't want to get in trouble and say anything bad about Washington Pinos. So um, we will just skip right over that. But um, I'm still, I'm still looking. I'm still looking and I know it's out there. I'm going to find it. But uh, I prefer, you know, St. Lucia Pinos and Oregon Pinos are my, are my go-tos. And besides French and our style characteristics are somewhat that lower in alcohol, mm -hmm. um, higher acid. We want our wines to lay down for and be as enjoyable 10 years from now as they are right now. Lisa is a booty and she holds me accountable when we're doing our blending and our fermenting in mm -hmm. order to bring out fruit so that those wines are very approachable when they're young because we're a small winery. We don't make a huge amount of cases, so we have to be able to turn those cases pretty quickly mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. you have to be able to make it drink now, but also... Like I say, just, I wanted to, you know, I want our cab to be as good 10 years from now as it is today. Oh, for sure. Now, um, as far as vintage, so you've got what, 10, 10 vintages under your belt? Yeah, we started in 2013 and our first crush was inside Darby Winery, just over on the other side of the oh, main yeah. road from us. I visited uh, a friend a few years ago and we went to Darby Winery. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. He is Darby English. He's a super nice guy. Mm -hmm. And I was working for Chris and Chris didn't have room for us for a mm -hmm. crush. And Darby took us in, but said, hey, you got about a year because you're I'm going to run out of space for you. Mm -hmm. And then and his assistant winemaker was Mary Walnack from Damsel Cellars. And we worked over there for a year, found our current spot where we've been since 2014. Mm -hmm. And then... Mary actually ran out of space over there and moved in with us in 2015. And then we gave her the same deal, said, hey, you got to be out in about a year. We're going to run out of room. Huh. And then she found a, she's right across the alley from us in her own space. And she just is expanding to a new tasty room as well. So it's kind of, it's very, everybody's very accommodating here in, here, here in the park. But we knew back then that we wanted to grow, but like I said, I, that was another way to save money that first year. But mm -hmm. we've been, we didn't start selling wine until January of 2016, because I asked Leisha if she wanted to cheat and buy bulk wine or do something like that and put our label on it. And she wanted to do everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. And as the uh, majority owner, I conceded and said, that, that sounds good to me. You know, so that's what we did. And then we made our first white wine to go with that first release in 20, in the year before in 2015 vintage, we released the Riesling as our first white to go with our first few reds. And we did really well. I mean, we, we did okay. You know, I think I got a 90 for my cab from Wine Spectator. So oh, I was great. pretty happy out the gate. We were, we were, we were doing okay. Oh, that's great. Now over the last 10 years, how, how has your winemaking style evolved? It hasn't changed Hardly at all, other than to be able to scale it to a larger volume. I try and keep it as close as possible. I have a, I don't have a recipe. I want our fruit and our wines to reflect the, the values of the year, right? So I want it to be very recognizable that, yeah, 20, 20, you know, you know, depending on the year, I want it to be, if this was a hot year, this was a cool year, this was a, a normal year. I haven't said normal in three years, but we want it to be respective and not, you know, our GSM is probably what we make the most of, mm -hmm. uh, what we're most known for. And every year the blend changes. Currently it's Mouvedre dominant. Last year it was Grenache dominant. We just bottled last week, the next vintage, it'll be Mouvedre dominant again. It just, you know, we try and be reflective of the, of the vintage. Sure. Yeah. I and we're low impact. We don't do anything. We try and keep it as simple as possible. Our rosé is naturally fermented. Uh, so, yeah. Not interventionist. Yeah. I no. talk to a lot of winemakers and I think that I always, it, it varies on how they, their wine style has changed or how their winemaking style. Usually a, a common theme is that it, they become a little less heavy handed in what they try to do with the wines. 
Yes. We'll let, let the lead and the wines make themselves and yeah. putting that subtle touch on versus when they first started there. Well, I think you learn over the years because you you get more comfortable with your own winemaking style. You feel more confident in your wines and your processes that you have in place in order to make the wines. And you feel more confident with your equipment and things like that. So it's just kind of, I think that that hands-off kind of comes natural over time. Yeah, I compare it. I was have a photography background. And if you look at like Ansel Adams and the way he treated his in his dark room, even the same prints from this early in his career to the later part of his career is they became a lot less, a lot less burning and dodging as he grew older. Yeah, I, I totally see that, you know, and I, I think about his portraits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So how, what role, talk to me about your barrels and what role wood plays in your... Own. All French, mm-hmm. all central France. I'm down to four cooperages now. Is that right? One, two, three, four. Yeah, I'm down to four cooperages now. I've been very fortunate being able to volunteer and work for a lot of wineries and mm-hmm. taste a lot of oak. And over the years, kind of my palette of the style of barrel that I like and what my net styles. And it's funny, like some of there's a, there's a couple of barrels that we use that from a certain cooperage that I hate the flavor of them when they're new, but mm-hmm. yet every time we use them as a neutral barrel, mm-hmm. our favorite wine is coming out of those barrels that is neutral, right? So you just never really know we have a green barrel of sometimes what's, what the, what the long-term outcome and how that barrel is going to, you know, settle and change the flavor profile of your wine over time. And, and we've, we've found it very fascinating with some of those. And like, I will never sell those barrels, right? I'm going to keep them as a neutral barrel as long as I can keep them in good shape over time. But we work with four cooperages from three coopers year over year. And I tend to do anywhere from as low as 28% up to 55%, like with the cab, new oak year over year. Yeah, so we we do a lot of blending, but you know, for a small winery, again, back in the overhead and things like that, barrels are the most efficient way for us to store wine long term in in efficient in a small amount of space, right? So it just it just really works really well for us, at least for our the way we're set up. That I'm fortunate in that I have about a 1,100, 1,200 square foot barrel room with 22 foot ceilings, and mm. we're able to stack them up in there and. I'm able to s- still scramble around and top them so pretty easily. So it's, yeah. Well, that's, that's handy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to give away all the company jewels, but it's, no. <laughs> you know, Cooper, it's just, there are <laughs> things like that. No, it's just kind of curious on, you know, everybody's got their own opinion on what wood should play in it, whether, and it sounds like a, a kind of a modest amount of new oak and. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want it to be over influenced. Not- you know, like I love, you know, Kistler and Aubert. I don't want to drop too many names, the Chardonnays, but Lisa and my wife drink a lot of Chablis. So like our Chardonnay is a compromise, right? Yeah. Because they're my chief testers, taste testers, you know, and have a lot of say in the, the end result of our wines. And, you know, so we, I want you to be able to pick up the nuances of that oak on the Chardonnay a little bit, but I, from a taste profile, I want it to be as as stainless as possible on the taste. You know, we just want that oak to give it a little bit of that refined mouthfeel to go with it. So um, you just, it's a, a lot of experimenting year over year with different different ratios, but we've pretty much got like Syrahs, Petite Syrahs, our cat. Mm-hmm. We've, we've got that nailed exactly how we like it and what coopers to use and how long we keep our winer in our barrel. And for instance, like our cab, you know, Lisa and I said from the very beginning, Red Mountain, it's, you know, it's big, old mm-hmm. calves with a, with a good amount of minerality and tannin here in Washington state. And we age ours for three years just to soften them up and make them very approachable so that when you're drinking a fresh vintage, you know, it's, you can drink it now. But like I said, we also want that acid to be able to be strong enough in there and the tannins soft enough so that we can lay it down for a long time as well. Sure. So you've got, uh, you're, I want to go back to your wine club. You have a really low, low attrition rate. How did you go about growing the wine club? It started with friends and family. And then us, we, we have probably our original tasting room was 200 square feet, maybe mm-hmm. 90, right? And then 
over time, we started tasting people as we grew over the floor drain, which is our washdown area out in mm -hmm. the main production area. So it became a real pain in the butt because every, we couldn't, I couldn't harvest on weekends or do uh, production items because we were open for tasting. But word of mouth here in Artisan Hill is one of the older production areas in Woodenville. There's some absolutely fabulous wines coming out of Artisan Hill. And, and a lot of people explain, don't know explain it. Explain Artisan Hill to me because I, I visually I, can, I remember where Darby English was and I remember. So where Darby was. is this warehouse, right? Mm -hmm. And warehouse is North Woodenville, as is Artisan Hill. And there's a Woodenville Duval Road kind of separates the two. So you have, um, and I'll try and visualize, you have warehouse up here. You have uh -huh. what's called the gateway right in front of the warehouse. And then you've got a road, right, that runs like this. That's Woodenville Duval Road. And then over here is Artisan Hill. And it's a series of warehouses, very similar to the warehouse district, but a little bit taller roof is, roofs, so more conducive to large manufacturing uh, um, areas. So for instance, like we, you know, our place used to be a wall bed manufacturing company. Uh, so a lot of sawdust when we first moved in, there was a lot of, a lot of cleanup in here, but no, no yeast. So that uh -huh. was a good thing, right? So yeah. we're, not, we're not fighting with anything and we put it in our own floor drains. So it's all, it's all good, but uh uh, and, and then there's other districts of Woodville and then south of Woodville in what is what's called Hollywood. There's that district, mm -hmm. uh, what they call the schoolhouse district, which is now there's a little bit of contention. There's two schoolhouse districts, I guess, in Woodville, oh. which is a newer area. There's a wine alley. I mean, Woodville is just blowing up with tasting yeah. rooms. And they're building a new hotel that's going to have mixed use tasting rooms underneath of it. Um, Moldax, which is a famous nursery here in Woodenville, is building a new retail and mixed use space, which will have wineries in it. So it's it's getting crazy. We have, I think, one California and maybe three or four Oregon tasting rooms here in Woodenville as well. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. How yeah. Many so people, how many wineries are in the Artisan Hill complex? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to get, I hope no one from Artisan Hill is listening. But Lisa. My partner, she is the treasury for the Artists and Hill Association. So, but I don't attend the meetings. I think mm -hmm. there's probably 20 of us here. There's a good amount. So people can yeah. kind of go on their own little wine trail through Artists Yeah, I mean, right next, we're between two distilleries. Brovo Spirits, which does fabulous um, uh, uh, vermouths, Amaro's, you know, Curacao. And, and they do a ton of stuff that is shipped all over the country. It's a biggest little secret in town. Mm -hmm. And with a massive production mm. space. And then, and then we have another place next door to us that does gin, absinthe, and vodka, which are really all really good. And so, I mean, Artisan Hill and, and Metier Brewing is across the street. So it's kind of a very, it's a mixed use area. The problem with it, we only have one restaurant here on the hill. So, like the, the north or yeah, the southern part of Woodville is better for wine tasting for out of towners because mm -hmm. you have Chateau Saint-Michel, right? Uh -huh. The big, the big, beautiful grounds of it, plus the concerts that they do and all the winery, a lot of tasting rooms, but not so many production spaces, right? Mm -hmm. So tasting rooms and places to eat. Whereas here, up here in the warehouse district and Artisan Hill, that's mostly production and tasting. Very good. Yeah. I've got to, I've got to get up there and check that out again. Going through like over the last like 12 years, it, making wine and thing. In hindsight, what would you have done differently? <laughs> Probably let somebody else pay for the winery. <laughs> uh, it's always, you know, as they say, the key of investing is always spend someone else's money, right? So mm -hmm. probably would have looked for additional investment or something like that to, uh, so that it wasn't such a, a burden on us or we felt so, I don't know. It's hard to describe. I mean, you have... Uh, you, you want to be, it definitely motivates us more to be successful, but at the same time, we want to have complete control, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and Lisa and I have been friends for over 20 years, you know, via work where we first met. And, you know, and that's, you don't want to go in business with family sometimes. No. You don't want to go in business with friends sometimes. But, yeah. you know, Lisa and I, a lot of people think we're married and because we talk to each other like we are. And we do it in front of everybody. It's just, you know, it's just how it is. And 
we, you know, we we're very fortunate in that we both get it. We both have the passion for it and we're, we're willing to spend the money that it takes to make a quality product. Um, and, and we don't, we don't like shortcuts. So it, it's just, I don't know. It's we've been very fortunate that way as far as as far as partnership goes. But what advice do you have for p- people in partnerships trying to keep it together and keeping it healthy? Fit, just- keep it, you know, set set goals for yourself. Mm-hmm. Set, you know, open communication. Don't hide feelings. Don't, you know, talk about everything that's going on. Don't try, you know, it it's you know, it's the same it's the same rules for a marriage, I guess, uh-huh. too, right? If you want to be successful. Um, you know, Lisa and I, we get it and we understand, we both know the work that it takes We're and we're willing to do the work. We're not, you know, a lot of people think that winemaking is sitting around and with French patriarchs and caves drinking wine all day. And it is probably, you know, 25% paperwork, 60% cleaning, right? I'll clean a tank three times before, you know, I use it sometimes. And it, it, that's the, and it's like, Chris told me a long time ago, you know, he's like making wines easy, selling it's the hard part, mm-hmm. right? So, and that is true. It's just a saturated market and you have to do things that distinguish you. And, you know, and again, back to that advice to people wanting to start a winery, you have to do something that distinguishes you from the other players in the field in order to get your name out there. And because there's, there's plenty of really good caps, there's plenty of really good Syrahs, yet how do you distinguish yourself? We feel obligated to make some of those wines because they're so good from our state, right? But to di- distinguish ourselves, we make some varietals that aren't so familiar with the state. We do Petit Syrah. We do Carmen Air. We, we do Senso Rosé. We do a stainless Chardonnay, right? I mean, we do, we do those kind of things that other people don't. You know, we do, when you come into taste at our tasting room, it's a $15 tasting fee. And you get eight wines. We we don't, you know, we're we want you to taste everything. We want you to have a full experience. We don't want you to go, well, I tried four. I'm gonna pay another fifteen dollars to try another four, right? Again, but you know, like I said, Lisa and I are fortunate in that, you know, our money goes back into the winery. We're both not looking to do anything else with this winery. So we just want it, we're kind of making it for people in the vision that we have for it. And, and hopefully we can so stay in that a few more years uh, or either we'll come crashing down. We'll see what happens, yeah. right? No, you, it's, you never know. It's nice to have the luxury to kind of, to let the winery evolve and to, you know, remain complete control of it. A lot of yeah. people that aren't as, that don't have the funding, they may have to make decisions out of desperation. Yes. Which suddenly then you get a little more of that me too aspect of the winery. Yeah. And we're trying had, to commoditize it. And we've had other friends that want to buy in or help out or do other things. And we always invite them to come here. And we, we say that, you know, sweat equity has to go with it. We appreciate the offer, but we want you to realize what we're doing in order, in order before you do that. And so far out of the two or three that have tried it, so like, hey, that was great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, that's a lot of work. I'm going to pass on that. So, <laughs> yeah, but volunteer help is it's spotty at best. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, we love our volunteers for bottling. Well, well you're, yeah, in general, though. <laughs> yeah. 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 For bottling, we use our volunteers, but we, we, we work family pretty hard during uh-huh. harvest and then we cut them some slack and let them go and don't try and bug them again for another eight months. I think that's the one thing, overworking the volunteers is kind of where it starts to break down when you depend on it too much or you have yeah. too, too few. Yeah. yeah. Now, on, you're, pa- you're clearly passionate. Now, the other question is, how do you stay motivated? By making new stuff. You know, we're, we're you know, we try, Petit Syrah was our first club wine. Um, we like, we named it Lake Royant, the Believer. Because we liked it so much, made a believer out of us because it just smelled amazing. And I had no intention of making it. Uh, the Williams family who manages Heart of Hill Vineyard up on Red Mountain, where we get our Petit Syrah from, I was just looking for, I wanted to make a, we wanted to do a Bordeaux blend. We wanted something different from everybody else in town. Uh, Scott suggested, hey, I've got Petit Syrah coming on. You know, we took it the first year that he harvested it. And he's like, 
you should try it. I love the flavor of it, you know, and I drank Stag Sleep and Con Cannon and other California Petite Syrahs. And, you know, I liked them, but I never really thought about them too much. And I, I think Washington Petite Syrah will stand up with anybody. And, uh, you know, and it worked its way out of our club into Mm -hmm. our our natural lineup, right? So we do a lot of club testing. So Mm -hmm. we just bottled our first Cab Franc. We have our last year, we did our first Merlot with our club. So we do a lot of test wines with our club, see how it goes, see what the uptake is and decide whether maybe that should move into the lineup. And then we got to take something out of the lineup because we don't want to have so many wines that we can't sell them all. We like to stay somewhat focused right now. We have probably two more wines than I'd like to have. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're, we're growing. We just got into the state of Pennsylvania. Um, oh, wow. So we're distributed in three states. Now we're working on our fourth state. So it, you know, we're, we're doing wines that are only for distribution as well. And that helps pay the bills, you know? Oh, for sure. For sure. So on the, on your percentage of sales is what percent direct to consumer versus distributed? Oh, six, probably 60, 65% direct to consumer. Oh, wow. That's good though. That's 35% to, in what States are you available in? Washington, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. (laughs) Well, we're in Texas. And the distributor went under uh-huh. right before COVID and uh, never paid us, unfortunately. Oh, no. Sad story. But we still participate in Texom every year. So we, we do pretty well with awards out of Texom. And then, so we're looking if anybody in Texas is listening. And then California, our distributor is also in California, but they're just kind of getting going down there. So they don't really have much sales. So we're listed for the state and we're licensed for the state, but we haven't done anything down there yet. Mm-hmm. So we're hoping that we're hoping that happens for us this year sometime that maybe uh, either they get it together or we've got a guy that's kind of a small independent that I'm hoping he does something down there as well. Oh, that'd be great. Can't wait to see him here. So my, where are you at, Drew? Sorry. I'm down in I'm down in Carlsbad. Oh, okay. Southern California. Yeah, I I spent nine years in South Pasadena. So Oh, did you? Yeah, it's, we're freezing right now. We're recording this in the middle of February. And for us, it's about 48 degrees out, which is, yeah. <laughs> for us, it's freezing. My sister lives in Laguna Nagel, and she, when she comes home up here to visit and stay with us, she is, I think she never takes the parka off, even indoors. So, you know, yeah. Uh, it was funny. The people that came, took us to the visit the Darby Winery, she was visiting us last weekend, and she lives in T- Tacoma area. Oh, okay. I came down deliberately without a jacket, without any heavy clothes, because she's from Washington. Yeah. And it never got above 52. Yeah. I think it was the coldest she's ever been. We we were in Vegas a couple of weeks ago and it was, you know, low 50s. You know, we're we're walking around in t-shirts. We're seeing a lot of people wearing coats. But it was pretty funny. We were like, wow, this weather is just fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So my, Mike, as we're wrapping now, is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to bring up? Support your local small boutique winery. You know, you have so many choices out there on the shelf. There's so many big wineries and those wineries are getting bigger every day and nothing against them. They are making some great wines and have some fabulous labels underneath of them. But, you know, if people have the opportunity to choose a wine, try and look for the smaller boutiques, talk to your psalms, talk to your wine store representatives, whoever is helping you with select a wine, pay attention to those shelf talkers. You know, if they're there, that give you a little explanation. And, uh, you know, of course, buy three of cups if you yeah. see it. But, uh, you know, we, I, I can't stress, you know, there's, it's getting harder and harder to be a small boutique winery. And I think as time goes by, you're going to see fewer and fewer of them. Unfortunately, and if you want to taste true reflection, you know, interesting wines that are a really good representation of the vintage years that they were made in and things like that by some, I think people should do it because it's important to do and support from a lot of the labels that are out there. And, and Hey, you know, when you go to that party and you want that go-to rosé from your favorite French house or California winery, go for it. Right. But when you're sitting at home, having a meal with friends and family, try something Try something from a small boutique winery. That is excellent advice. And to everyone who is kind of annoyed at the consolidation in industry and the bigger guys swallowing up the smaller guys, you got to support the smaller wineries. That's the only yeah, way they're going to stay yeah. afloat. Yes, absolutely. Because those those labels get eaten up. So um, 
And I've lost a couple of friends here in town, you know, that are either closing or calling it. And, you know, we're sorry to see them go because they were making, uh, like one of my favorite Alberinos was here in town. And besides my own, we're yeah. making Alberino too, but um, we don't, we typically can't get enough of it. We end up blending it with something oh. else. And, uh, and I'm still trying to convince Oh, so here's my other thing. I'd love someone in the state of Washington to plant some chocolate. That's yes. my go. That's my go-to white. I think it would thrive really well here in Washington. So if you do plant it, give me a call. I'll I'll take an acre. That would be great. Yeah, I do <laughs> think it would thrive, and it would probably actually thrive more on the west side too. Yeah. Well, uh, I still the good chocolate I had was up in Glethio, which is right on the coast. Yep. It Very is, similar. But- but they they've got some good they've got some good weather there. So yeah, you know, my wife and I really enjoy Basque region. And so and but it's it's funny. That's one of the few varietals, you know, I'd like to see here in this state that I just I have not seen yet. Now, I haven't seen it anywhere in in United States. So I don't I don't think I have either. Yeah. Yeah. I need to next time I'm over there, I need to I shouldn't say stick some vines in that suitcase. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have been the first time that's happened. (laughs) I promise to go through agricultural. Yes. (laughs) Well, Mike, where can people find out more about you and Three of Cups? You can hit our website, www.3ofcups, all spelled out, T-H-R-E-E-O-F-C-U-P-S dot com. And we we ship to just about every state that it's legal to ship Mm -hmm. to. Some direct, some indirect. And then, uh, you know, ask for us at your local retailer. You want to get, you want to get new wines into a local retailer, constantly ask them for it because they have ways of doing it. So. Sure. That's, that's great advice. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Drew, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to be a, a legend of the industry. A true legend behind the craft. I can't wait to visit next time I'm in town. Awesome. No, please do. And uh, yeah, make sure and shoot us a heads up and we'd love to host you guys. Will do. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. You as well. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Mm-hmm.